Keeping the land back. Alright y'all, you ready? Let's all remain seated.
good to see you tonight. I'm glad you're back with me this evening in this worship service tonight and to study the scriptures together. Let's take our Bibles and open to the book of Romans, chapter number 4. Romans chapter 4. I want to read again the context of what, we, what I was preaching on back in the spring on the nature of saving faith. We got almost done. We didn't get exactly finished. We got the last few verses left tonight on the nature of saving faith, and we'll look at the last point of that uh, tonight, the nature of saving faith. In Romans chapter 4, uh, the context is verses 17 through 25. Welcome to those who are joining us on Facebook. Glad you're with us tonight as well. Hope you have a Bible with you. If you do, turn with us to Romans chapter number 4, verses 17 through 25. I want to read that tonight. If you have your Bibles open, you're able to. Please stand with me. In honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Let's hear from the word of the Lord. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and was raised because of our justification. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are tonight for the public reading of the Holy Scriptures. We're thankful for this opportunity once again to assemble together in this place to worship you and praise your name, to call on you, Lord, and to hear from your word. We're thankful and grateful for justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for reckoning and imputing his righteousness to us, and our sins to him. Thank you tonight, Lord, as we look at this passage and closing out of this chapter. We pray that you give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in your word. I humbly ask you, Lord, that you would take me and empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit tonight, that I would be able to preach your word in power and demonstration of the Spirit. I ask that you would use me tonight to speak clearly and accurately and expound upon your word correctly. And I pray, Lord, that you speak through me for your name's sake and for your glory into the hearts and lives of those who are here and those who are watching. I pray, Father, that your will be done in every life tonight and we would learn more about you and, the, and this wonderful thing called salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you did for us when you came to this world and went to the cross of Calvary. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for taking our place and our punishment and paying the price for our penalty on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. As we just read at the close of this chapter, you were raised for our justification. We're grateful for that tonight, Lord. Now have your way, we pray tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the Apostle Paul has laid out in this chapter, as begins chapter 4, the illustrations of justification by faith alone. His first illustration denies being able to be justified by works in verses 1 through 8 in this chapter. Paul makes the argument of man's pride and arrogance in verse 2. If man could be justified by works, man would definitely boast about his works. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it tells us that we're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest anyone should boast. So it's not by, justification is not by our works. His second illustration denies being able to be justified by ceremonial rites in verses 9 through 12. He uses the ceremonial rite of circumcision as his argument. The Jews believe because of this religious practice they were justified. So Paul clearly refutes their ideology with sound doctrine. Abraham received justification by faith in God's word 
years before God told him to be circumcised. There is absolutely no religious rite or practice that man can do to be justified. His third illustration denies being able to be justified by keeping the law in verses 13 through 16. This was another key argument against what the Jews believed about their justification and acceptance with God. His argument that Abraham was justified by faith hundreds of years before the law came to Moses could not be refuted. The law brings about the wrath of God instead of justification. It was given to reveal the sinfulness of our sin and lead us to Jesus Christ as our Savior. Paul then moves to the last section of this chapter that I read to you just a few minutes ago describing the nature of saving faith in verses 17 through 25. The first point Paul lays out is saving faith is in God's precepts. It's in God's precepts in verses 17 through 19. Abraham believed in what God had spoken to him, not considering his own body and Sarah's body well past childbearing years. He believed God was able to call things that do not exist as though they did exist. He knew God gives life to the dead. Matter of fact, later on after Isaac was born and grew up, God told Abraham to take him to a mountain. He would show him and to offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham didn't question anything. He got up the next morning, packed up his stuff and his mules, and he got the stuff for the sacrifice, the wood for it, I should say, and headed out there because he believed that if God wanted him to kill him, God would raise him from the dead. The writer of Hebrews tells us that. And so he, but his saving faith was in God's precepts. The second point Paul lays out in the nature of saving faith is in God's promise. In verse 20, we see that. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham did not waver or doubt God's promise, but fully believed that promise God had made to him from the very get-go that he was going to make him a father of many nations. Because of this, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Faith in God honors God, and God honors our faith in him. The third point Paul lays out on the nature of saving faith is in God's power in verses 21 and 22. Abraham was covered over with full assurance that God had the ability to carry out his promise. God's ability is unlimited, unwavering, unchangeable, and undeniable. If God promised it, God got the power to, to fulfill it. Amen? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says this, Now to him who is able, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so the nature of saving faith is in God's power to perform his promise to save us. Now we move to the last point of this great chapter on the nature of saving faith, and it is in God's provision. This is the last point. It's in God's provision. Verse 23, beginning there. Now it was not written for his sake alone, his it being Abraham. So this was not written for Abraham's sake alone, that it was imputed to him. God provides what God requires. God requires perfection. God requires holiness. God requires complete righteousness. This is what he requires. He, he requires complete obedience to his holy law. Well, we saw this morning in the message this morning that we're incapable of meeting that righteous requirement, right? We have fallen in sin, totally depraved in sin, so we can't meet the righteous requirement of God. So God provides what God requires, his perfect, holy, and complete righteousness. Listen to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7 through 9. The way of the just is uprightness, O most upright. You weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And so with God's judgments in the world, God's word in the world, we learn righteousness. What true righteousness really is. In Isaiah 45, uh, verses 18 and 19, it says this, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. 
I declare these things that are right. God has provided justification to all whom he has chosen, not just to Abraham, as verse 23 says. Not Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Imputed is a bookkeeping term. We, we studied this. Of course, it's been so long ago since we've been in the first part of this chapter. I want to remind you of that. But we, we first studied that Greek word because it's used uh, 11 times in this chapter. The Greek word is for imputed. Uh, now, we've seen uh, accounted in the English here, but it's translated from the same Greek word. Accounted, imputed. You may have the word reckoned if you're using a King James Version. It'll have the word reckoned there. But it's the same Greek word that's used 11 times in this chapter. And it is a bookkeeping term. Here it means to post to the account of or to the credit to the account of. It means to take an asset out of one account and transfer it over to another account. That's what this word means. So if you got a savings account and you had a checking account, you want to transfer some money from your checking account to your savings account, that's, the, that's what this word is talking about. Well, in this sense, it's saying that God reckons our accounts or he imputes our sins to Christ's account and he imputes or reckons uh, or credits Christ's righteousness to our account. That's what it means. And because Abraham believed God, his sins were transferred over futuristically to Christ's account. Christ hadn't come when Abraham was living, but this is what took place. Because Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him as righteousness. That account went to Christ's account, and the righteousness of Christ was transferred over to Abraham's account. This is exactly what happens to everyone who is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24. But also for us... It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, The only thing God received from Abraham was his imperfect faith. But by his divine grace and mercy, he reckoned it to Abraham's spiritual account as righteousness. That gracious reckoning reflects the heart of God's redemptive revelation and is the focus on both the Old and New Testaments. God has never provided any means of justification except through faith in Him, end quote. So justification comes only by faith in God. And of course, it's in faith in Christ Jesus and His finished work. When a sinner believes in Christ, the perfect righteousness of God purchased by Jesus at the cross is transferred to the believer's account while the unholy sins of the believer are transferred over to Christ's account. Isn't that beautiful? think about that. Christ made the payment for us on the cross. He took our place, substituted himself in our place that he might take the judgment of God that we deserve for our sins because our sins and our iniquities were laid upon his body and it was accredited to his account and when we believe in Christ by faith, his righteousness his perfect holy righteousness then is accredited to our account by the Father. The, the verb tense proves when it says in this verse, let's look at the verb tense, first of all, verse 24, imputed. It was imputed. That's a past tense verb. But the verb tense proves that it is an immediate transfer, a complete transfer. It's a present transfer and a finished transfer. It's a one-time deal. We don't have to keep getting justified. Aren't you glad of that? Amen? Justification is a one-time deal. When we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified forever. <clears throat> justified forever. Because man is incapable of meeting God's righteous requirement of perfection, there had to be one who could take the place of those who can't meet that righteous requirement. So this is exactly what Jesus did when he came into the world. His life was so important to his overall work of procuring salvation for us. Jesus Christ had to be perfect to meet the perfect righteous requirements of God. Because man can't do that. This is why it was so important that Jesus Christ be born of a virgin. And, of course, God declared that was going to happen from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 when he told Satan that uh, he would be enmity between your seed and her seed, the seed of a woman, right? Jesus would be born of a virgin. God gave Isaiah that prophecy that he would come forth from the virgin. And we see that fulfilled in the Gospels, especially in Luke, uh, when he shows us Gabriel going to see Mary, and the virgin. And how Jesus would come through that way. He had to be that way. Because if he had been born like all of us are. Having an earthly biological father. Then he would be corrupted. 
just like we are too. Amen? Because he would inherit that sin nature like we talked about this morning. That he would inherit the guilt and corruption of Adam. That sin nature he would have. So he could not meet the righteous requirements of God. But because he was born uh, just of the woman and not having a biological father but God the Father with his father, then he's God in human flesh and he is perfect. Even though he was born under his law, he was able to meet that righteous requirement in his own righteousness because he was perfect and holy. So his life is just as important as his death on the cross and his resurrection. He had to be sinless, uh, thus the incarnation and virgin birth. Matthew 5, 17, do not, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. Talking about the law and the prophets. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writing about Christ in verse 22 through 24. Who, Christ, committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So Peter very clearly tells us that Christ was perfect and holy and righteous who never sinned. But he took our sins on his body that we might be live for righteousness, might be declared righteous. Hebrews 4.15, the writer of Hebrews says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ was tempted. We saw, we, you can read the temptation where Satan comes to him after he's baptized. He goes in the wilderness and fasts 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan comes to him and tempts him. Well, Jesus overcomes those temptations with the word of God. Satan leaves, but he doesn't leave him alone. He says it comes back to him another opportune time. Satan was always bringing temptation for Christ. Not all of them is recorded in Scripture. But Jesus every time passed the test. He never yielded to temptation. He was without sin. Jesus met the righteous requirements of God, thereby substituting himself in our place on the cross to bear our sins and to pay our penalty, as the Word of God tells us that. So verse 24 says, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Look at verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So here's the, here's the gospel together. We see the life of Christ is perfect. And now we see that he's delivered over to be crucified for our offenses. And then we see he doesn't stay dead, praise God. He's raised for our justification. The total work, the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ is so important. First of all, we see in that verse, who was delivered up because of our offenses. Delivered is translated from the Greek word paradidomi. It comes from two words, para meaning up, and didomi meaning to give. So together it means to give up or to surrender over, to deliver over to another. God the Father surrendered over his own son, Jesus Christ, into the hands of sinners to go to the cross for us and to take our place and die. He was delivered over to expiatory death. That's what he was delivered over to. <laughs> expiatory is to have power to atone for or to offer by way of expiation or propitiation. Expiation is the act of making amends. The act of making amends. When Christ died, it was an expiatory death. He was making amends between us and God because they need some mending to be made. We are enemies of God in our sins. Amen? We're not friends of God. We're enemies of God. We're separated from God because of our sins. We are guilty. We are criminals against God's law. But Christ came to make that expiatory death for us, to make an amends for us with God the Father. And propitiation, that means appeasement or satisfaction or atonement. Christ's sacrifice on the cross appeased the wrath of God, satisfying God's justice forever. Amen? And so Christ became the atonement for our sins. So he was delivered over for that, so that we could be reconciled to the Father and justified by faith in Jesus Christ. This is how a God who is just can also justify the guilty. It is through the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Look over in Romans chapter 3, again in verse 23 through 26. It tells us that here in this passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 26. The Word of God says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, leaving no one out. Every human being born of this world is a sinner, separated from God. We fall short of God's glory. We can't meet the righteous requirement of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this is how we're justified. This is how we are made right with God. Whom God set forth, He delivered Him over as a propitiation. There it is as an atonement, as an appeasement by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of one who had faith in Jesus. So God who is just and holy, and being just means He's fair, and He gives to people what they deserve, right? Right? So if he gives to us what we deserve without an expiatory death, we would all be judged in our sins and be condemned forever. Right? But because of Christ coming and taking our place, that expiatory death, Christ was able to make an amends for us with God, and now we can be justified by faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. You see. Isn't that wonderful? God is just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Go back to Romans 4, verse 25 again. So it says, Who was delivered up because of our what? Offenses. It was because of our offenses that Christ, Jesus, was delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified on the cross of Calvary, to be our expiatory death. Offenses is translated from the Greek word, parapipto. It means to fall aside. Figuratively, it means to apostatize or fall away. This word implies that we are an offense to God. In other words, we literally offend God. Our sins do. In our sins, we are an offense to God. We offend Him. Our sins offend God. You know, we, we live in a day with so many people getting offended by so many things. They need to be worried about offending the one they are offending, and that's God Almighty. That's the one we need to worry about offending. Amen? Is God Almighty. Because sin is an offense to God. Our sins, no matter how big or small that we think or we categorize them, they offend our Creator. They're an offense to Him. You know, this has lost its punch in the pulpits in America today. It has lost its punch. It's lost its prick. The hearts of people are not pricked anymore because of their sins. They're not broken because of their sins. Because they don't see the seriousness of their sins. They don't see how... The, the, the atrocity of sin, the enormity of their crimes against their holy creator, God who made us for himself to bring him glory, how we fall way short of that because of our sins. It's lost its punch in pulpits today. Our sins stink to high heaven. They are vile, putrid, and atrocious to God. They deserve the swift, righteous judgment of God. We absolutely deserve death. Yet Christ took our place and died for us. Amen? He took our place and died for us because of the love and grace and mercy of God for those He chose before the foundation of the world. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. Look at this. Romans 5, 6 through 9. For when we were still without strength, that means weak, not able to do anything for ourselves. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That word ungodly can be translated as irreverent and wicked. So while we were still in our sins, without strength, not able to do anything for ourselves, to make ourselves righteous, to make ourselves right with God, not being able to appease the Holy Creator who made us for Himself, not being able to glorify His name, Christ Jesus in due time died for us. That's what it says. Now watch this. Verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. You can scarcely find a righteous, uh, for anybody to die for a person who's righteous. He says, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to take their place and die for them. Look across the world, you won't find anybody to do this hard, he said. 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You, it's hard to find somebody to die for a good person that the world thinks is a good person, right? But we weren't good. We were far from good. We're the opposite of good. We're irreverent. That's what it says up in verse 6. We're ungodly, irreverent, wicked, hell-deserving sinners, and Christ died for us. That's the demonstration of God's love for us right there. You want to know about the love of God? There it is. That's how God shows His love to us is by Jesus coming and taking our place and going to the cross. Look at verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. This is what we're saved from, church. We're saved from the judgment of God. It was poured out on His own Son for us. Jesus took that judgment for me and you on the cross of Calvary. So we can be delivered from the wrath and judgment of God. This is the divine love and grace and mercy of our Father for us. The penal substitutionary, I'm sorry, penal substitutionary death of Christ and His resurrection is the greatest display of God's glory in all of history. And I preached that one time. I think it was Easter, wasn't it? The greatest display of God's glory was when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary and took our place and died and then rose again from the dead. The greatest display of God's glory. Look at verse 25b. Now we saw it delivered up for our offenses. Now let's see the second part of this great verse. And was raised because of our justification. So we talked about his perfect life, his perfect righteous holy life, living that life for us because we can't. We talked about him being delivered up for us, for our offenses. Now we see not only did he do that and die, but he didn't stay dead, hallelujah. He rose for our justification. If Jesus Christ had lived his life perfectly, and he did, he kept the whole law of God. He met the righteous requirement of God. He went to the cross and died, and he did that. They buried him in that tomb. If he was still in that tomb today, we would not be just, we could not be justified. He had to come out. He was raised for our justification. Just as his life was important, his death was important, so is his resurrection is important. The word justification in this verse is translated from the Greek word dekakousis. It means an acquittal for Christ's sake. Justification. It comes from the word dekakuo, which means to render or show just or innocent. To render innocent. To be righteous. That word comes from the word dekakuos. It means equitable in character or action. It implies to be innocent are holy, to meet righteousness. And so justification is a term that shows us how we are made righteous, or how we are declared righteous, I should say, in Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was vital in our justification. Hence, it tells us here in this verse, He was raised for because of our justification, to be declared righteous by God the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, His resurrection was proof that God had accepted Christ's sacrifice for our sin. That God's justice has been satisfied. That God's judgment has been appeased. And, and that now because of Christ's death, God says, that's enough. Nothing else needs to be done to reconcile them to me. And so Christ was raised. His resurrection was God's stamp of approval on Christ's finished work. God accepted that. Without Christ's life, substitutionary death, and resurrection, we can never be justified. We can never be declared righteous. We can never have heaven. We can never have eternal life. This is why justification comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ's finished work alone. It doesn't come by Christ and what we do. Amen? Right. Or what we don't do. <laughs> It comes through Him alone. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Isaiah 53, one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture about, about Jesus' suffering. 
Isaiah 53, verse 5, beginning there. Listen to these verses. But he is referring to the Messiah, Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise literally means to crush him. It pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The work of the suffering Savior to save the elect. Those God had chosen before the foundation of the world, Christ's work would atone for them, and it was not a wasted work, as I said this morning. John MacArthur writes on this story of Abraham in his commentary, he says, The story of Abraham and of his faith is important to us today because men are now saved on the exactly the same basis on which Abraham was saved. Trust in God. Even the sacrificial work of Jesus was the provision for Abraham's sin by which God saved him. Men today have much greater divine revelation than Abraham had, and we do. We have the whole word of God, don't we? Abraham didn't have this. But we do. We have a greater divine revelation than Abraham had. During his lifetime and for many centuries afterward, there was no written word of God. Yet Jesus declared categorically to the disbelieving Jewish leaders that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. End quote. For the faith of Abraham. The nature of saving faith is in God's precepts, his word, God's promise, that he's made, God's power to carry out what he has said and what he promised, and God's provision. He provided what he requires. Righteousness. And that comes through Christ and Christ alone. Amen? Amen? Being a Baptist doesn't make us righteous. Being baptized don't make us righteous. Mm -mm. That's just the showing of what happened when we trusted in Christ. We are made righteous or declared righteous because of our faith in Christ Jesus alone. Amen? Amen? He provides everything for our justification. And that's what Paul writes at the close of this. As he's been giving illustrations of justification. See, he's in the section on justification in Romans. And we're still going to be in that section in chapter 5. Matter of fact, it ends at the end of chapter 5. But he's still talking about our justification. And how important it is for us to understand how we are justified. And how we are made or declared righteous. Uh, to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for this time we've had together in the study of the Scriptures, and we're grateful for the work of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and procuring our salvation for us through your life, through your uh, time on the cross, through your death, and your resurrection. We can be justified by faith in you, Jesus, because of you and what you've done. We declare today we praise your name for that. We love you, Lord. Help us to understand even more justification and what it means. And help us to share it with those who are lost, those who are blinded by their sins and the enemy, those who are wrapped up in religious works trying to justify themselves before you. Help us, O oh God, to share the truth of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Lord, help us, Lord, to be your witnesses, we pray.
Guide us and lead us now tonight, we pray. And God, we want to pray as we close this service for those who are in the path of this hurricane as it's made landfall today. We pray for their safety. We pray for help from you with them, Lord, tonight. We thank you for that. I pray you to bless and have your way in every life and every heart tonight. If there's one that's watching here, Lord, I pray that they're lost. I pray tonight, God, if they've not been justified by faith, that tonight you break their hearts over their sins with godly sorrow that would lead them to repentance and faith in you, Jesus, that they could be justified by faith in you tonight. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll stand. Thank you.